a few comments about Dante's life. He's Italy's greatest writer. He's like Shakespeare in England, Goethe in Germany, Cervantes in Spain. One of the graduate students, Zhang Xiaoyi, is thinking of going to graduate school and studying Dante. And she has an interview that's coming up tomorrow with some people from a university, and they're going to speak to her in Italian. So she's nervous. So uh, there is a guy, he's an astrophysicist. His name is Lorenzo. Something Nelly. I can't remember the first part of Something Nelly. Anyway, really nice guy. Met him last year, and, and so, you know, I said, you know, I might have a situation where one of my students would need to do a mock interview in Italian. So, you know, just to practice and so forth. And he said, okay, no problem, you know. You're a native speaker. You know, my, my oral Italian is terrible. So, in any case, uh, I said to him, well, she's doing Dante. And, and I said, have you ever read Dante? And he said, oh, yeah, in high school. Oh, God, oh. You know, sort of like, oh, you know, that, that horrible author, you know, Dante. And, you know, this is the way a lot of uh, students in North America feel about Shakespeare, too, because, you know, if you, <laughs> if you go to school in North America or England, you've got to start studying Shakespeare, you know, in junior high school, and you read, you know, Julius Caesar, and then you read Macbeth. And, you know, and a lot of people just hate Shakespeare. In any case, uh, he's like Shakespeare, he's like Goethe, like Cervantes. Friedrich Engels, this is uh, the you know, quote that I always used to get when I first started teaching in China. Students don't think of it so automatically now. But in the uh, Communist Manifesto, the close of the feudal Middle Ages and the opening of the modern capitalist era are marked by a colossal figure in Italian, Dante, both the last poet of the Middle Ages and the first poet of modern times. So I get a lot of students, you know, or I had a lot of students writing about how Dante was the first Renaissance author and so forth, and I had to keep saying, mm, yeah, I, think I still see him as more medieval than Renaissance, but he is a transitional figure. T.S. Eliot, of course, a great uh, lover of Dante. Dante and Shakespeare divide the world between them. There is no third. So you've all studied Shakespeare, and now you're studying Dante, so you're so lucky you've got the two greatest authors that ever lived, according to Eliot. Of course, he wasn't thinking about anything except European literature. And then James Joyce, who was an atheist. I love Dante almost as much as the Bible. He is my spiritual food. The rest is ballast. Ballast is junk you put in the bottom of a ship to hold it level. There is the statue of Dante in front of Santa Croce. I took that picture about three weeks ago myself. Beautiful sunny day. Very severe, huge statue in Florence. There is a statue in the town square of Trent, Trento, where I studied my Italian briefly uh, at the University of Trento. And my wife took the picture, and there I am. 25 years younger, but I look exactly the same, don't I? Maybe my hair wasn't quite as white. Anyway, and there, you know, I was trying to get a recording. I knew there was a recording, beautiful recording, long playing record at that time, before all of these new types of things. And uh, so I went to a record shop across the street from that park. And I go to the clerk and I said, you know, I want the recording of Dante. You know what he said? He said, who is Dante? <laughs> Dante, you know. No, Dante. Because he was thinking, you know, it's like going in and saying, I want the recording of Madonna or something. You know, he thought it was Dante was some singer, you know. There is the um, Dante by Giotto. This is in the Bargello Museum in, in Firenze, in Florence. That's what he looked like as a young man. And Giotto actually knew Dante. So this is probably the most accurate portrait we have of Dante. It probably, you know, if it wasn't drawn from life, he at least drawn from memory of what Dante actually looked like. So this, you know, it's kind of nice to look at that and think, well, here is the man that fell in love with Beatrice, right? There is the handsome young Dante, not the Dante, the severe uh, moralist 
you know, that, that's the way we usually think of Dante, <laughs> Botticelli's, uh, Botticelli's uh, famous painting of Dante. Dante had a dark complexion, and according to Boccaccio, when Dante lived in Verona and had become a famous author, as he passed a group of women, one of them said to the others, Isn't that the man that goes down to hell as he likes and brings back news of them below? To which the other replied, Indeed, it must be him. Do you not see how his beard is singed and his skin is darkened by the heat and smoke that are below? (laughs) And so (laughs) you get the impression, I don't know, this is, who knows whether this is true. It's a really good story. But, uh, you know, people actually thought that he had been down to hell and come back. He claims he has. You know, this is no dream that he's talking about. He tells us several times it wasn't a dream. He actually made the journey. Right? So Singleton, one of the American critics, he says the biggest fiction of Dante's Divine Comedy is the fiction that it's not a fiction. You know, he emphasizes it's not a fiction. There is uh, the portrait uh, I like the best of Dante because he's reading. Now, lots of times, you know, you get students say, I want to be a writer. You know, what do I do? Well, that's what you do. That's what you do. Every writer has to read. And what I like is he's reading two books at the same time. (laughs) I don't know what he's supposed to be doing. Maybe this is, you know, this is a commentary, and that's Aristotle or something, but he's obviously doing, uh, you know, what you're going to be doing, too, as you, read the, uh, as you read the Inferno, you're going to be looking at the notes at the same time as the text, right? have to consult both. Dante's personality, according to an early biographer, Bilani, is, was the man was somewhat haughty, reserved and disdainful after the fashion of a philosopher, careless of graces, and not easy in his intercourse with laymen. And then Boccaccio says, Dante's expression was ever thoughtful and melancholy, although he smiled a little when he overheard the woman talking about the (laughs) reasons for his dark complexion. So he had a bit of a sense of humor, and we'll see that. There is some humor in the Divine Comedy, not much, but he did have a sense of humor. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, in Santa Croce Church, painting on the wall, a beautiful sort of depiction of not only of Dante, but of the whole world of the Divine Comedy. So uh, in the middle you have Dante. He's wearing this long gown, which was actually not only did people in medieval Italy have their own dialect, they had their own, their own kind of dress, so you could recognize where a person was from by the way he was dressed. And this particular type of down was what Florentines wore. He's holding his book. The, that's the first page of the Inferno, the Divine Comedy. And here is the realm that's described in the Inferno. Hell, and you can see the, the souls being taken down, and not very happy about it, to hell. And behind him you can see the mountain of purgatory with the souls going around the terraces. These are the souls of the proud. So the souls of the proud have a kind of therapy they have to go through to help them rid themselves of the sin of pride. And the therapy is that they have to have a very big, heavy rock on their backs, and they have to walk along like this, and not just for a few days, but for hundreds of years. (laughs) And eventually they rid themselves of the sin of pride, and then they go up to the next level. And if they've got a problem with this is envy, I think, then they have to stay there for a while, and they go up and up and up. And finally, they get back to the Garden of Eden, where humanity started out all those millennia ago. Then above purgatory is the heavens. So there's the poem, there's hell, there's purgatory, there's the heavens. And the last part of the picture, which is true to the emphasis of the poem, is Florence itself. That's the communal, what I call the communal journey, right? The idea that part of the poem talks about the problems of society. And I've showed this for years and never realized that what he's actually doing, I found this on the net or in an article in JSTOR, what he's actually doing is holding his poem and uh, he's uh, 
looking at Florence, and he's going like that, you know? And, and the implication is, read my poem, take warning, or that's where you're going, you know? So it's not quite like that, but I mean, he's going like that, and it's sufficiently clear that, you know, this is the warning to Florence that they don't want to end up down there with the souls that are being taken off to hell. That's the Duomo, the famous church in Florence. So this is anachronistic. The, the, the painting is not correct chronologically because the Duomo did not exist during Dante's time. But it's the most famous landmark of Florence, and so the painter puts it in just to, so you don't have any trouble recognizing the city. Uh, there are lots of interesting things about Dante's life. You might want to read uh, more about Dante's life on the internet or in the library. The Princeton Dante site has a good short biography of Dante. Uh, you can find Boccaccio's Life of Dante, Vita di Dante, in an English translation. I think that's on the Princeton site too, or just Google Boccaccio, Life of Dante. you will come right up. You can read that. That's where a lot of the uh, anecdotes and information about Dante's life come from because, of course, Boccaccio was working on uh, his biography of Dante not long after Dante's death. So there's only two things we really can talk about here in any detail. We'll talk a little more about Dante's political problems later. But uh, first of all, uh, so two tragedies, two great tragedies of Dante's life. The first was the death of Beatrice. Now, in Italian, that's Beatrice, and uh, for years and years I said Beatrice, and then the students, I got the idea, they think I was just being affected or showing off my Italian, you know, and I tried to tell them, well, I have an aunt, or had an aunt, she's gone now, Aunt Beatrice, and she was an extremely unhandsome woman, you know, even as a young woman, as, so the first time I met her, I thought, wow, what an ugly woman this is, you know, I mean, my whole family are not very well, you know, not very handsome people, and the women, ugh, on my father's side, my mother's side is fine, on my father's side, very ugly women, and as she got to be older, you know, when I really knew her well, she really, really was not very beautiful, and so I, I had trouble saying Beatrice, and thinking of this beautiful Italian woman, but I'll try to say Beatrice. So the first question is, is she or was she a real woman? Now, because there was, you know, there's a tradition of poets making up women to write about. You know, the whole question, of, did Shakespeare actually have a subject for his sonnets? Petrarch's Laura seems to have been a, a woman he just imagined so that he would have somebody to write about. So the question arises, you know, was she a real woman or is, was she just made up by Dante as a kind of idealized lady that he could write love poems to? Well, Boccaccio asserts that she was a real woman, that her name was Bice Porcinari. And Dante, of course, never uses her shortened name, Bice. He always calls her Beatrice. She eventually married a banker by the name of Simone de Bardi. Dante himself also had a wife and four children through a marriage that was arranged by his parents when he was 12 years old. We'll talk more about this, I mean, obviously. If you want to have a kind of idealized relationship with a member of the opposite sex, it can't be, unless you're very lucky, with somebody who was arranged to be your wife or husband when you were only 12 years old. So, I mean, arranged marriage means that in the Middle Ages, an idealized love affair occurred outside of the story of Dante's love for Beatrice is told in the Vita Nuova, The New Life, published in 1292, or released to the public in 1292, was Dante's first important literary work. In The New Life, we find out that Dante met Beatrice when he was nearly nine years old, and Beatrice was eight, so it was a very early infatuation, nine times Already since my birth, the heaven of light had circled back, the sun had circled back to almost the same point, when there appeared before my eyes the now glorious lady of my mind. 
Nine years later, they met again, and when she greeted him, you know, this, this is like, you know, so she said, hello? You know, that was a big deal? Well, it was. She said, hello to me. You know, at that moment, I seemed to experience absolute happiness. So, according to Boccaccio, the relationship was a platonic one, we use that term, I mean non-physical, in the tradition of courtly love. It lasted until Beatrice died in 1290 at the age of 23, so she didn't live very long. People didn't live very long in the Middle Ages, but that's, you know, if you survived early childhood, that would still be very sad to die that young. And then 27 years after their first meeting, Dante completed his work, Vita Nuova. So because of Beatrice's continual association with the number three, Dante called her a miracolo on earth. Because three is the number of the Christian trinity. The Christians have the idea that there's one God, but there are three persons. It's sort of like the Buddhists have the idea there's one Buddha, but there are different manifestations, right? There's the Amitabha Buddha, there's uh, Milofo, you know, there's uh, other Buddhas, but that doesn't mean there are many gods. It means there's just one Buddha, but there's different ways of seeing Buddha or different aspects of Buddha. So this number three, we'll talk more about number symbolism in a moment, this number three is the number of what is spiritual in Western culture, because it's the number of God. So the fact that, you know, he met her when he was nine, nine years later, she died in 1290, 23, 27 years later, he writes the Vita Nuova, 999, nine, nine, or 3 squared, 3 squared, 3 squared, and he decides this has got to be significant. As Beatrice walks the streets of Florence, Dante claims he heard the passerby say, this is no woman. This is one of the beautiful angels of heaven. So she was like, for him, an angel on earth. So she was a real woman who was supremely attractive, both in body and in personality. And love for her became a way for Dante to become a better person. I'm trying to think of ways to explain this to Chinese students, the idea that you can cultivate yourself, you know, that you somehow, through study, through meditation, you can make yourself into a more spiritually perfect person. Well, for Dante, his love for Beatrice was a form of self-cultivation. Right? Through this love, he was able to come to perceive the absolute beauty of the world and the beauty of God. So for Dante, Beatrice became a manifestation of divine love on earth. He thought her life was a trace, a clue of the divine that only he was able to discern. Only he was able to see the meaning of all of these mysterious threes. Only he was able to see the significance of her very name because Beatrice comes from the Latin Beatrix that means bringer of happiness, right? Salvation. And the Italian word salute. I think it today in Italian, when you say salute, you're drinking. You know, it's like cheers. You click your glass, salute. But uh, you say salve if you want to say hello. But apparently in Dante's day, if you want to say hello, you said salute. So, you know, she met him and she said salute, meaning hello, and he heard salvation. Right? <laughs> so, you know, for him, that had a religious significance. At the end of the Vita Nuova, Dante says he will honor Beatrice's memory by writing for her another work, such a work as has never been written before for any woman. And of course, he was thinking, planned at that point, that it would be comedy. In one respect, you can see the Divine Comedy is simply a courtly love poem. I mean, it's a poem in praise of Dante's beloved lady. In the Romance tradition, if you've studied other Romance works, medieval works, you know there's often a conflict between the erotic and the divine. In the story of Lancelot and Guinevere, of course, it's an adulterous love affair that eventually brings about the destruction of the round table. You were with us last semester and 
the medieval literature class, the English medieval literature class, you know, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the definite conflict there between Gawain's uh, code of conduct and the fact that the lady of the castle is tempting him to have sex with her. In the comedy, Dante takes the metaphor, you're an angel. You know, you say that to your girl, oh, you're an angel. He takes it seriously. Because the love of the lady is a love that can lead him to God. We call this in modern psychology sublimation, transformation of a sexual energy into something more abstract, often into art. So Beatrice allegorically represents Christian faith, theology, even Christ himself. She helps Dante see the feminine, nurturing, caring side of God. But she also represents herself. She's a historical 14th century Florentine lady, the object of the passionate romantic affection of a historical Florentine man, Dante Alighieri. And what's really, really, really interesting is that in that scene at the top of, and I think I'll have Xiao Yi come into class and talk to you about this. This is what her thesis is about. At, at the scene at the top of the mountain of purgatory, you know, you're expecting, so Dante's going to be reunited with Beatrice. It's going to be like a Hong Kong movie, you know. Oh, like this? No, nothing like that. Just totally surprising. She treats him really badly. And, you know, uh, why? Because she is jealous. After his death, she says, you were interested in another younger woman. Una Pargoletta, she says. Now, of course, the critics all immediately say, oh, she means philosophy, you know, you abandon the study of theology for philosophy. So, yeah, maybe, but, you know, Pargoletta, that's a pretty definite term for a young, flirtatious woman, right? What did she look like? Well, nobody knows. That's a beautiful painting <coughs> that was at the Millennium Art Gallery. They had, uh, I think it was a year of Italy in China, uh, 2006, and they had all of these beautiful Renaissance paintings brought over from, this, this one I think is in Florence, from the Italian art galleries, and they were displayed at the Millennium Art Gallery. And of course, all of the rubrics were in Chinese, and so I had no idea who had painted this or anything. And, but I bought the poster, and I took it home, and Donald Stone, you know, came into the apartment, and he said, oh, you've got a nice... Polilo or something. I don't even know how to pronounce it. And I said, oh, really? Can you spell that for me, you know? And I immediately looked it up on the net, and then I was able to identify. The medieval ideal of feminine beauty included small breasts, <laughs> high forehead, and blonde hair. So, and, you know, you think, Italians? Blonde? Yes. In northern Italy, a lot of blonde Italians. So maybe something like that. The second great tragedy of Dante's life was exile from Florence. So Dante was an active politician, I told you that earlier. In 1300 he was elected one of the priors of Florence. Now Florence had a sort of strange municipal governing system. There wasn't one mayor, there were four mayors. So he wasn't the mayor of Florence, but he was one of four, I guess you'd call him uh, chief executive officers. While he was in office, a rival party, and we'll talk more about the blacks and the whites and the Ghibellines and the Guelphs later, a very complicated political situation in the city, a rival party came to power. Uh, well, Dante luckily was out of town. He was on a mission to Rome. He was falsely accused of corruption, which happens a lot today when, you know, parties change and they want to get rid of the previous leader and find some charge. And uh, at first he was uh, told that he would be fined. He refused to return to Florence and pay the fine because he was innocent. And so then they changed the sentence to death. And Dante never returned to Florence. He became a fierce critic of the city, uh, not so much of the city as, as the politics of the city. Later in life he called himself Fiorentinus Nazione, non moribus, a Florentine by birth, but not by behavior. So uh, very, very major problem. 
hard for us, I don't know, maybe not for you, but for me, you know, I've, once I left home and went to college, I never went back for any extended period of time, you know, but for a person in the Middle Ages, you know, to be exiled from your city, the place where you really should live and you expected to live and so forth, where your family was, very, very big problem. Halfway through his life then, and this begins to give us the context for the opening of the Inferno at the age of 36, Dante was deprived of his family, left his wife and his sons behind, his job, his citizenship, and his personal safety. So those opening lines of the Inferno that talk about the dark wood in which the fictional Dante is lost and despairing must have been a feeling that Dante himself experienced as an exile walking the roads of medieval Italy, trying to find some place where he could get food and shelter. Dante's great-grandfather, Cacciaguida, character of the Paradiso, when Dante meets him in heaven, prophesies. Remember, this is 1300. The uh, imagined time of the journey that Dante makes is the year 1300, the millennium year, and therefore he can predict what's going to happen to him in the future, but it hasn't happened yet. And so Cacciaguida gives Dante a prophecy of his future life, and of course it's a very sad future. You shall leave everything you love most dearly. This is the arrow that the bow of exile shoots first. You are to know the bitter taste of others' bread. You'll have to eat other people's bread, not your own, right? You'll have to be a beggar. People will give you bread. You'll find out how salt it is and know how hard a path it is for one who goes descending and ascending others' stairs. It's really beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> You've got to eat this bread that you begged from somebody and you'd be going up to your room and going down from your room, but it won't be your own house. It'll be somebody else's house, somebody else's stairs. Of course, Dante's exile was not a tragedy for us. In fact, it was extremely fortunate, since it gave him the time and the motivation to write the comedy. It's not clear that if he had remained an active politician in Florence, that he ever would have been able to find the time to write these three long, complicated, beautiful volumes of poetry. How often the great works of art have been products of sorrow and hardship. So Dante worked on the Divine Comedy for 19 years. Can you imagine? Milton, you're familiar with the story. He lost the government post that he had, Latin secretary to the government of Oliver Cromwell. He was sentenced to house arrest. When, with the restoration of the monarchy. That was the end of his political hopes, right? A personal tragedy, but on the same time, it gave him both the time and the inclination to write Paradise Law. Cervantes, according to legend, got the idea of writing Don Quixote while he was in prison. You know, poor Cervantes had a very, very rough life until practically the end when suddenly he became a spectacularly successful author with the publication of the first volume of Don Quixote, 1605. Here is a manuscript illumination, one of my favorite illuminators, one of the few that we actually know the name of, Giovanni di Paolo, 15th century, you see Dante being exiled, right? Pretty clear, pushed out the door. And then it's like a comic book. Here's the break between the frames, and here he's sitting in some other city, writing his poem. So Dante exiled from Florence. Dante's death. Dante became more and more famous in his later years. His life became easier. He was given hospitality by some of the most powerful families of Italy. Of course, they had to be politically the right families. He still had lots of enemies, certainly the Pope and the Church was still his enemy. At the time of his death, Dante was a member of the court of Guido da Polenta in the city of Ravenna, over on the seacoast. Ravenna was threatened uh, with an attack by the city of Venice. These cities were fighting with each other. In Dante's time, the Italy did not have a national uh, sort of governance. 
Each city was its own political entity. They're always feuding and fighting, carrying on. And so Venice was threatening to attack Ravenna. Dante was sent to try to make peace. Actually, he wasn't successful, but he didn't know that because on his way back, he got malaria, which, of course, is a treatable disease now. It was fatal then, often fatal, and uh, he was an old man. It killed him. So he's buried in Ravenna. And, you know, you, you think, oh, you know, I have to see Dante's tomb. What does it look like? You know, nice Gothic, at least, structure? No, neoclassical, built in 1780. You know, it doesn't look like anything that's appropriate for Dante. But that's, that's his tomb in Ravenna. Now, of course, Florence soon came to regret having exiled Dante, you know. <laughs> and so they built this monument to him. And a lot of people, well, I was just there, this is a picture I took myself a few weeks ago. And, you know, they don't really get it that Dante is not there because this is a famous church. It's got Michelangelo, it's got uh, Machiavelli, you know, these famous Italian, uh, sort of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Westminster Abbey of Italy. All the famous uh, Italians are buried there. And, of course, it says Dante, Honorate, Latissimo Poeta, you know, from his own honor, the highest poet. That's uh, what, uh, what uh, the souls in limbo say when Virgil returns with Dante, when he goes through limbo on his journey down through the inferno. In any case, uh, they think he's buried there, but he's not. You know? And Florence now would give anything to get Dante back. They tried to steal his bones back, and somebody in Reventi hid them, you know, not recently, this was earlier. And you walk around Florence and there are quotations from the Divine Comedy chiseled into various parts of the city where Dante referred to, like on the, the bridge, the Ponte Vecchio over the Arno, there's a, a, a line from Dante that's chiseled into the side of the bridge where he talks about the river Arno in the Divine Comedy. So even during his lifetime, portions of the comedy which had been completed were being read and admired. The appearance of Paradiso was eagerly awaited. Like Virgil's Aeneid, the comedy was an instant bestseller. There are 827 manuscripts of the poem. That's an extraordinary number. There are 90 manuscripts and partial manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales. There's one manuscript of Sir Gawain, one manuscript of Beowulf. If it were St. Thomas or Aristotle or, you know, a theological work or the Bible, of course, there'd be thousands of manuscripts, but for a vernacular work, 827, absolutely demonstrating how important people thought the poem was. Dante himself refers to the Commedia as a sacro poema, a holy poem, and the work soon came to have almost biblical authority. It was the subject of numerous commentaries almost as soon as it was completed. Now, it's comparable to the situation of Hong Oman in Chinese literature, where you get, you know, I love the term, redologists, right? That, uh, <laughs> you know, the experts on the Hong Oman and writing notes and analyses and interpretations and so forth. Now, that if you want to refer to a Dante scholar, you call him a dantista. It's one of those irritating Italian nouns that looks like it's feminine, but it's not. So it's dantista. If you're a man or a woman, you're a dantista. And then if you refer to the community of Dante scholars, they're called dantisti. This is a manuscript from the late 15th century of the Commedia. And it shows the relationship or the proportion between text and commentary. And this is the text. That's the commentary. Here, here and here. No, this is the text. Yeah, this is only, only that much is text. The rest of it is all commentary. Actually, I think this might. This must be text, too. And this must be text. So this is commentary. This is commentary. And that's all commentary. So it shows you, I mean, this is the kind of treatment that the Bible got but hardly a work of vernacular literature. Here's another one. It shows you again how much commentary for the amount of text that's involved. And uh, some people still do this today. Uh. 
And I hope you do that too. You've got a nice book now. Start, start your notes, and by the time you get to my age, you'll have so many notes you can't even read them. This morning I was thinking, what is what is that that I'm saying about that line? You know, I had to get a magnifying glass, and I was looking at it. I can't figure it out. What am I trying to say there? And I still don't know. It must have been a great idea because you see, I highlighted it. I've got all these notes, and the ones that are in, in highlighted in that orange were last year that I thought of them, and I still can't read it. Must have been a great idea, lost forever now. What about Dante in North America? Well, in the early days in North America, there was a fear of papism, I was called, because most Americans were Protestants, and they were worried about Irish immigration, just like now they're worried about. Asian immigration, right? You know, the threat of Irish immigration. The Irish are going to come and they're going to take over our country and they're going to make everyone become Catholic and the Pope will run the whole country and everything. Sort of a scare. And so Dante, being such a clearly Catholic writer, was suspicious. It's hard to believe for us today that he was considered a dangerous writer, right? The poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, gathered a small group of Dante scholars at Harvard University and uh, he met them, and they talked about his translation into English of Dante, the first American translation of the Divine Comedy into English. And this so-called Dante Club, what they called it, soon became the American Dante Society, which is now the most important group studying Dante in the world, even surpassing the number of Dante scholars in Italy. Today, the number of editions, translations, books, articles about the comedy is overwhelming. As with Hong Lo Meng, both scholars and amateurs are fascinated by every detail of the work. However, there is yet no theme park like Grandview Garden for Dante's poem. And I challenge every year, I say this to the students, you know, you're going to go out, you're going to become important people in China. Remember your Dante. I think there should be a place where you can go Go through the inferno, climb the mountain of purgatory, go to heaven and see something that looks like God. I think that would be a great thing to have. Uh, I love Grandview Garden. If you haven't been down, Da Guan Yin, right? It's not far from here. Just get on your bicycle, start riding south. About two hours later, you'll get there. It's fantastic. You know, you get to see all of these settings of that beautiful uh, CCTV television version of Hong Wo Mang. And it's pretty much like what I was saying, you know, about Dante. People are down there, and you hear them talking, and they're saying, "Well, this is where Dayu lived, you know, and, and here's where Baoyu met Dayu, and they buried the flowers and everything. And you realize, for them, it's history, you know, it's not a story, you know. A lot of these people think, no, that actually happened. What a beautiful place. 